Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you in your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. We get ready to worship God with an offering. What I want you to know, Rescue Church family, is that when we give to the Lord through this church, some of our giving goes directly to make a difference in the world through supporting missionaries just like Brian and Carrie. Can you imagine? On Tuesday, they're getting on a plane. They're heading to Brazil to a brand new place to live. They're taking their family, leaving one of their daughters behind. Like this major life change, and we're players in that. Like some of you have never even met this, this couple and this family but we're, we're players in that, and we're supporting them, and we have a vital role in that. So that's cool. But our vision isn't just about the other parts of the world, the uttermost parts of the earth. That's part of it, but some of it's right here at home. And I want to talk just real quick about an opportunity coming up very soon for us as a church family to grow in our faith and in our walk with Jesus. So starting on Wednesday night, September 20th, we're kicking off a, a school for the whole school year. We're doing Wednesday night, like a midweek Bible study type thing. We're kind of going old school. And uh, we're starting it on September 20th with a really cool event called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. It's really not a Bible study. It's more of an enrichment thing, uh, marriage enrichment thing. But it's, here's how the format for Wednesday nights are going to go. 6 p.m., we're serving supper. It's for everyone. Like, come on, join us. It's, it's supper for everyone. At 6.45, we're kind of clearing the supper mess away. There will be child care provided for both the nursery age kids as well as bigger kids, fun stuff for the kids to do. And then the adults, we're going to have an hour up here together together from 7 p.m. to 8 o'clock and it's going to be a great time together Wednesday night starting September 20th so I want you to know that and we're, we're just going to run with that all through the school year and the idea is we want to provide a connection point for God's people to get together someone said it really well actually it was Monica from Monica McMahon from our Flandreau campus said Sunday morning our focus is kind of out it's big it's reaching out Wednesday the focus is going to be kind of inward where we're taking care of one another and it's that discipleship and that fellowship growing together in, in, with one another and growing deeper into God's word. That's the idea of Wednesday nights, all right? So I want you to be aware of that. And then finally, I want to talk about an opportunity to go serve. This is for our Flandreau campus. Coming up in October, it's our church's turn to get to do the Meals on Wheels. If you're unfamiliar with what that is, that's where we go around and deliver food to the shut-ins, the elderly people that are on that list. It, it takes about a half hour to do I'm pretty sure I hold the world record for doing it in fastest time. I think one time I did it in like 16 minutes. Like my old water delivery days kicked in and I was flying. So you should probably be a little slower and connect and like talk with people. I was just throwing food and it was awesome. Like I set a record. But anyway, hey, Lila, would you please pass this clipboard around? This is a, a sign-up sheet. If you're able to help deliver Meals on Wheels for October, the sign-up sheet is coming around and uh, that's just a simple opportunity for us to go serve and make a difference in the lives of people here in our community. So, having said all of that, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward at this time and wait on us for our offering this morning. I love being a part of a generous church. I love getting to serve the Lord in a church where there's generous people, not only with their time and their talents, but also with their, their resources as we obey God in this matter of giving. So let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask God to bless our offering this morning. And uh, then we're going to dismiss some kids for rescue kids. All right, let's pray. God, we're so grateful for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house with your people. Thank you for the, the beautiful weather that we're having outside, Lord. Thank you for the freedoms that we have in this nation that allow us just to get up on a Sunday morning and go to a public place of worship where the name of Jesus is lifted up and magnified we have so much to be grateful for this morning, Lord, and we worship you, we honor you for who you are and what you've done in our lives and what you're doing in this church. I pray that as we give to you right now, Father, that you would just help us give freely and generously out of hearts of gratitude for all that you've done for us. Lord, you know the needs that this church has. You know that you've given us a vision that's so much bigger than anything we can afford, and so we, we need you to provide. And I just pray that you would do that powerfully now through the generous giving of your people in this place. Today, Lord, we lift up Brian and Carrie Surratt. I just pray your blessing over their family this week as they head off to Brazil to share Christ with people there. I just pray that you would protect them, provide for them, keep them safe as they go. Lord, we, we also, as we look around our nation this morning, we just want to lift up the thousands and thousands of people who are being impacted all around the country from different hurricanes, flooding, fires lord none of this is beyond your notice you see it all 
And I pray you would help us to recognize it and recognize that we have a very brief window of time to know you, to live for you, and to share you with others before we step into eternity. I pray that these disasters that we see happening around the world today would be reminders of that, that this life is so short. And uh, Lord, we pray for your protection uh, for those people that are in the direct path of this storm that's ripping up through Florida right now. We just pray for those in the aftermath of the mess down in Texas and Louisiana, Lord, for the wildfires that are just running out of control out west, that you would just protect and provide and watch over your people in each and every one of those situations, Lord. We commit that to you in prayer. And uh, God, also, as we're on the, the verge of another anniversary of September 11th, we just pray for all of those lives that are affected by that every single year, the families that that touches so deeply. There's so much going on in our world, Lord Jesus. We need you, and uh, we love you. We worship you. I just pray that today would be a powerful day in your house here in Flandreau and in every one of our other locations. Lord, thank you for each and every one that's with us this morning. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. All right, as the offering buckets are coming around here in Flandreau, boys and girls, you can now be dismissed to head on out for rescue kids. Go enjoy that cat if that's possible. So... It's fun stuff. And before I start preaching this morning, I just want to say a special welcome to those of us joining online, at least those that have sounded off and said something on our iCampus. We want to say hello to Troy Mead. What's up, Troy? The Fulton family up in Brookings. Ron LaChica, I hope I'm saying that right. Brittany Lynn, I know we've got Gabe watching on, uh, he's dispatching today and he's, he can join us for church from work. Gabe, it's awesome having you with us. Thank you for serving our community as a 911 dispatcher. We've got Greg over in Germany. Greg, great to have you with us. We've got Tibbs on the iCampus with us. It's, and I know, like we always say, there's, there's plenty more people than that that just aren't sounding off and letting us know that they're there. But Flandreau, would you please put your hands together and help me say good morning to everyone on our iCampus. <laughs> Welcome. It's great to have you guys with us. I know I've got some of my fire guys watching, and they're probably wondering, does John always preach with a Vikings jersey on? I got to tell you real quick, guys, how many of you know that this weekend is an awesome weekend? Put your hand up high if I can. Okay, there's not many hands up. So what that tells me is there's people who need to become better Americans here and probably Christians, all right? Like some of you don't even know that this weekend is the opening weekend of the NFL, another season of football. Let's just breathe that in for a minute. It's a good week. I don't, ex I, don't, I don't sense the excitement from you guys out there, but I'll tell you something else that we can breathe in for just a moment. For those of us who cheer for the Vikings, at this moment, the official season has kicked off, and our Minnesota Vikings are undefeated, right? So we can just breathe that in for a moment. That's because they don't play till tomorrow night, and so I was like, this is the one chance I can probably wear this jersey out in public and not be ashamed of wearing it. So anyway, let's be in prayer for the Vikings as they play tomorrow night. But seriously, I want to talk about why I'm wearing this jersey. I always, every season, I look for at least one opportunity to wear a Viking shirt to church. And here's what I want to talk about today. All joking aside, he's, some of you are like, how is he going to transition this into preaching from John chapter one? Watch, okay? All joking aside, today, and you don't, you don't have to be a fan of football to appreciate this, okay? Some of you don't love football and you need to get right with the Lord, but that's fine. Um, all across the country today, there's going to be football games happening where there's going to be a bunch of men running out onto the field wearing jerseys that they are not ashamed to wear. Because for them to wear that jersey and represent their team, they don't even care what team it is. They don't care if their team's going to be good or not. Like, I mean, they care, but they're just glad to have made the cut. Because you might not be aware of this, but here real recently, all of these NFL teams had their training camps, and there was a lot of people who showed up to the training camps who did not make the cut to the final 53-man roster that is now running out on the field today. So they don't care. What you see on the field today, at least from an athletic standpoint, okay, I'm not talking about moral and all of that. I'm just saying from an athletic standpoint, what you see represented on the fields of the NFL today are the best of the best in terms of athlete, athletes, athletics. I tried to stay them together. It didn't work. You know what I'm saying? Like, you have to be pretty good to make the cut. 
And so if you made the cut and you're on the team, you're just thrilled to have on the jersey. And in our time together today, as we open up the Bible to John chapter 1 and continue our series through the book of John, I want to talk about making the cut for Team Jesus. How do we join Team Jesus? We're going to learn that it's an entirely different process than what they're looking for in NFL players, for which I'm very grateful that Jesus has a whole different set of criteria for what he's looking for as he invites us to join his team. Because in John chapter 1, as we open God's word to verse 35 today, we're going to see as Jesus really begins his public ministry, he's going to build his team. At least he's going to start to build his team of disciples and followers. Okay? John chapter 1, verse 35. We're going to get through the end of John chapter 1 today. We're going to bite off a big chunk of scripture and uh, push through verse 51 Um, We're going to jump in in verse 35. It starts by saying this. John writes this. He says, The next day, John, and which John is he referring to here? John the Baptist. I always try and make that uh, clarification. The guy who wrote John is not the same as John the Baptist. So this is still talking about John the Baptist here. The next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, and we looked at last week, he said the same thing. Look The Lamb of God. That's what John the Baptist said about Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? We're going to pause right there because there's a few things I want to point out. First of all, for the third week in a row, as we look at John the Baptist, I'm going to point out this theme again. I've I've been telling you that John the Baptist came preaching with authority teaching with authority it would have been so easy for him to make it about himself and to build this following of his own ministry and yet he clearly recognized who jesus was and who he was like he recognized his role was to point people to jesus not to make it about him there's a huge lesson in that for all of us it is not about you and it's not about me it's about jesus it always has been it always will be and and so we hear again john looks at jesus and he says the same thing he said last week when we looked at that scripture look the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world And once again, John is elevating Jesus and pointing people to Jesus. Now, it's interesting. It says that he had two disciples there with him. Who were they disciples of at this point? They were followers of John the Baptist. And by the way, I'll I'll just ruin the the surprise. We're going to find out in just a minute. One of those disciples, his name is Andrew. So we're going to be introduced to him in just a minute. And most people believe the other guy uh, that's being referred to here is John, the guy who wrote the book of John. So these are two disciples of John the Baptist. They were like, wow, this guy's got something worth saying. We're following him. John the Baptist points to Jesus and he says, look, the Lamb of God. And these two disciples leave John the Baptist to go follow Jesus. And that's, again, just John the Baptist, I got to highlight that. Like he understood it's about pointing people to Jesus. But then I want you to notice the question that Jesus posed to these two disciples. Jesus turns around and he sees Andrew and most likely John following him. And he just kind of stops him and he's like, what do you want? Some translations say, what are you seeking? Jesus said to these disciples, what are you seeking? Or in other words, what are you looking for? Hey, guys, I got to tell you, like, this is a question I think every one of us needs to answer as we make a decision to follow Jesus. What are we looking for? See, I think sometimes we, we follow Jesus maybe for the wrong reasons. Is that possible? Yeah, it happened all the time in the Gospels. People were attracted to Jesus for the wrong reasons. Sometimes, even in our world today, the Gospel is presented in such a way that basically says, hey, if you have Jesus in your life, here's what you'll get. You'll get uh, prosperity. You'll get health out of the deal. You'll have a better marriage. Like, we, tr- we treat Jesus as a means to an end. It's really not about Jesus. It's about what we get out of the deal. Jesus is just the way to get that stuff. And I think Jesus would pose that same question to every single heart in the sound of my voice this morning. What do you want? Why are you following me in the first place? Now, I should just say, like, I don't think it's a bad thing that our marriages improve as we submit to and follow Jesus. I don't think it's a bad thing that we start following God's wisdom on how to handle finances. And as a result, like, this old school stuff actually works. 
and life gets better. But I, I think we need to be careful not to buy into this idea that just because we have Jesus in our life means we're never going to experience trials and tragedies and issues in our life. And if that's why you're following Jesus, you're coming to him for the wrong reasons. We need to follow Jesus because we recognize he is the Lamb of God who dealt with our sin problem. That's why we follow Jesus is because I needed a Savior because I was lost in my sin and I could not forgive myself. I could not deal with my sin problem against a holy God. I have to accept Christ for who he is. That's why we follow Jesus. So that's a very powerful question that Jesus asks. Verse 38, let's keep going. So here's their response to Jesus. They said, Rabbi which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And look at this next phrase. It says, and they spent that day with him. And for some reason, John wants us to know it was about four in the afternoon. It's an interesting detail. It's like John, that's why we think he's probably the other guy with Andrew is because like he knew exactly what time this was. It's almost like this made such an impact on his life the moment he met Jesus. He's never going to forget that moment. Do you remember where you were when you really kind of connected the dots and you saw Jesus for who he was? And you're like, whoa, it's not just about religion. Whoa, it's about a personal relationship with a God who loves me. Like John, it just made an impact on his life. But here's what I want you to notice is this, that when these guys, Jesus asked them, what do you want? They responded with a question, where are you staying? What do they mean by that? Like, what are they really asking? I don't think what they're asking is we are curious as to the geographical location of where you're sleeping tonight. What they're really communicating is this, is that, hey, Jesus, we're not content to just have a brief conversation with you on the road. We want to get to know you. We want to spend time with you. We want to be invited into your life. We want to follow you. Where are you staying? Where are you staying, Jesus? And it said, notice I, I pointed that out to you, like they spent the entire day with Jesus. And I love this fact that Jesus didn't say, well, oh, look at the time, I gotta go. Um, Jesus invited them to come. Come on, I'll show you. What's the application of that for our life today? I wanna say to anyone watching this message today or joining us here in Flandre today, if, if you just logged on to this and you're watching, like, why is this guy on stage preaching in a Vikings jersey? That's creepy. Um, I'm just going to tell you something. You might be searching for answers to the question of who is Jesus? What is all this stuff about Jesus? Why are there so many passionate followers of someone who lived 2,000 some years ago? What's the deal with all of this? I don't even know if I believe it. I have so many questions and doubts. Here's what I want to challenge you with. That phrase, they spent the day with Jesus. I want to suggest you and I can spend the day with Jesus as well. So how do I do that? How do I spend time investigating the claims of Christ? Well, this is a radical concept, and I'm going to suggest it after I just held up football as the greatest thing on the planet. What if today you just went home this afternoon and turned the TV off and spent some time reading through the book of John and asking Jesus to reveal himself to you. Lord, I want to know who you are. What if you made a commitment over the next few weeks? I'm just going to get up in the morning and have some quiet time where I just read through the book of John to discover for myself who is Jesus. I'm here to tell you, I believe if you have a heart that's searching and you're looking for the Lord, I believe he will reveal himself to you. I think he'll say the same thing to you that he said to these two disciples. Come on, I'd love to spend time with you. Come on in. I would love to introduce myself to you and let you get to know who I am. Jesus is always the one that initiates that relationship with us. And that's what he said to Andrew and, and most likely John was, come on, you want to spend time with me? Come on, I'll, I'll, I'll get to know you. And I think he'd do the same thing for you and me today that he did for these disciples. Okay, verse 40, let's keep reading here. Next verse, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Poor Andrew, like most of the time, he's just referred to as Peter's brother. Did you ever have that growing up? Like, oh, are you... Randy's brother? <laughs> no, I'm John. That's who I am. Stop asking me if I'm Randy's brother. Okay, anyway, that's therapy for a later time. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. See, Andrew was one of those guys. Look at this next verse, guys. The first thing Andrew did, what was the first thing Andrew did after meeting Jesus? Was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, 
We have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And look what he did. He brought him to Jesus. Who is Simon? I already told, well, it already told us, but who is Simon? Peter, right? Simon is Peter. We're about to see Jesus give him a new name, but at this moment, his name is still Simon. But a lot of times in the New Testament, they'll call him Simon Peter, uh, all right? But Peter goes on to become one of the founding members of the early New Testament church. But we also know Peter was kind of messed up, too. We'll get into his story here in just a moment. But I want you to notice this, this chain that's happening here. Notice the progression. John the Baptist told Andrew about Jesus. Did you catch that? John the Baptist basically introduced Andrew to Jesus by saying, look, there's the Lamb of God. When Andrew recognized Jesus for who he was, and when Andrew made a decision to become one of Christ's disciples, what was the first thing Andrew did? He went and told his brother Simon, and he brought him to Jesus. It's interesting, there's like three places in the book of John where we see Andrew listed by name, and every single time we see Andrew listed by name, guess what he's doing? He's bringing someone to Jesus. Another one of those one of those places was when he brought the little boy who had the fishes and loaves And then jesus did this amazing buffet on the on on the shore. There's amazing stuff, right? But andrew was always bringing people to jesus This is kind of cool to think about church think about this for those of you and us who know christ as our savior Like we've made a decision at some point in our life to become christ followers check this out. It's a really cool thought There is an unbroken chain from your life, your soul, all the way back to Christ himself throughout history. What do I mean by that? I mean, the fact that you came to a saving knowledge of Christ was because somebody shared Christ with you, most likely. I mean, I, I know God can circumvent that process and he can directly introduce himself to us. He has done that. But most of us come to Christ through a chain process where somebody told us about Christ and introduced us to Jesus and in some cases even brought us to Jesus. And in order for that to happen, there had to be another link further back in the chain for someone to have introduced them to Christ, someone to have introduced them to Christ. You see what I'm talking about? That chain that goes all the way back to the beginning. And, and here's the thing, like here's another application from this scripture is that after we have accepted that invitation from Jesus to come and see, you want to know who I am? Come on, I'll spend time with you. I'll let you know who I am. After we have accepted the invitation to come and see, and we decide to become Christ's followers, there is now a mandate on our life to go and tell. Come and see becomes go and tell. Go and tell others and bring them to me. It's all about me. It's all about Christ. That ought to be our goal as Christ followers is that we are just that living link in the chain that at least passes our faith on to at least one other person, if not countless people. Because if we go on from Peter, like we know Peter became one of the foundational links in the early church. Man, all kinds of people came to Christ through Peter's ministry. And that's how God wants to use our lives as well. How sad would it be if when we stand before King Jesus someday, we come to realize we were a broken link, like the chain stopped with us. Someone cared enough to share Christ with us, and we came to know Christ, but then we stopped sharing Christ with others. And at least for our story, we became that broken link. Oh, that'd be a good title, because that's like an internet thing, isn't it, when there's a broken link? I should have spent some more time developing that. That's a, such an internet thing. I'm so proud of myself for making that technological observation. So some of you that geek out on technology, just develop a message called a broken link. Don't be a broken link. It's really good. Sometimes the ADD kicks in when I'm preaching. All right, next verse, next verse, verse 42. Actually, it's the same verse that we paused in. They brought Peter to Jesus, okay? Let's pick up the story, what happens. Next part of verse 42. Jesus looked at him. Jesus looked at Peter and said, you are Simon, son of John. He's about to get a new name. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Does anyone know what Peter means in another word for Peter? Like Matthew tells us, there's, I think it's in Matthew 16, uh, where Jesus says what Peter means. Does anybody know? Rock. 
You rock, Peter. That's what Jesus was saying. You rock. No, no, Jesus was saying, you are going to be this foundational rock upon which I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18, I think is where Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What's happening here? Guys, this is so powerful. Um, Jesus looks at Peter. And, and by the way, some translations say that Jesus looked intently at Peter. What did he see when he kind of looked intently at Peter? He looked below the facade. He saw past the external shell of Peter, which was full of flaws and failures. He looked beyond the faults of Peter. And what he saw as he looked intently at Peter, a guy who, by the way, had all kinds of faults, and what he saw is instead of seeing the flaws, he saw the potential of Peter's heart. He saw what Peter, not what he was, he saw what Peter could become. And Christ called that out in him. He spoke to a new identity. He spoke to what he had already put inside of Peter, even though, here's one of the things I love about the Bible. The Bible does not sugarcoat the flaws and failures of its characters. I love that. Because if everyone in the Bible that we kind of hold up on a pedestal, you know, Moses and Abraham and all these guys, David, like if it never told us the bad of them, we would just think, well, I'm not Moses or Abraham or David or Paul. And, and Scripture does not hide their flaws from us. And so it helps a guy like me look at their life and go, wow, if God can work through someone like Peter. He could probably do some things in my life too. And I came today to tell somebody that Jesus Christ, as he looks at your life, he does not stop his focus on the failure that you had yesterday. I mean, don't get me wrong. He knows about it and he sees it. He died for that on the cross of Calvary. His blood was shed for the pornography you were viewing yesterday. For the adulterous thoughts and the lustful thoughts you had yesterday, Jesus poured out his blood on the cross. I'm not minimizing your sin or my sin our priorities that get so out of whack, the greed that drives us, the impatience that we deliver to those around us in our relationships, like that's all really a big deal that cost Christ his life on the cross. But he doesn't stop there as he looks at us. He looks deeper and he looks at a heart of what he has put inside of us, the potential of what we could become if we submitted to him, if we walked with him, if we followed him. He can change us from being this guy by the name of Simon who we're going to find out as we go through John and as you study Peter's life he shoots off at the mouth all the time he speaks before he thinks he's very impulsive I, Peter like he and I are connected because I just see a lot of my own failures in Peter and Jesus didn't say man Peter you're going to screw up really big as a matter of fact on the night that I'm arrested Peter you are going to deny the fact that you even know me not once not twice but three times he didn't go there he said Peter you have a new name and it means rock. Because on this rock, I'm going to build my church. I just got to share this real quick because it's my story, and, and so I think I share my story better than anyone else. And, and so some of you have heard me share this part of my story before, but it, it means something to me because I recognize my story in Peter's story. And so just real briefly, I'll tell you, like, when I was at this point in my life years ago, as I knew God was calling me into some form of pastoral ministry, like I knew he was, and I was running from it, I was scared to death. And, and I was trying to tell the Lord that he was making a mistake. Like, God, up to this point, I'm pretty sure you're batting a thousand, but you're getting ready to make a mistake with this. You don't want me. And I'm telling the Lord in my conversation with him, I'm not old enough, and I'm not smart enough and I don't have any experience, and I don't have a degree, and I had all these insecurities, and I, I knew my flaws and my failures. I'm like, God, I don't even know that I like people that much. Like, why do you want me to shepherd your people? Pretty sure I'm not the guy you're looking for. And, and I really look back at a pivotal moment in my life where I heard from the Lord, not some audible voice, if that freaks you out. Like, I'm not that guy that God tells me every morning what to have for breakfast and that. It's just, if you've been following the Lord for a while, you kind of learn to discern his voice. And sometimes he speaks very clearly. Just He puts something in your heart, and you just know you've heard from God. Have you ever had one of those moments? And I know I clearly heard from the Lord, and he basically said, Hey, John, 
I don't need you to be old enough or smart enough or have a degree enough or be experienced enough. I need you to be willing enough to obey me and to follow me and to watch what I can do through the heart of someone who's yielded to me because it's not really about what you bring to the table, John. It's not about your abilities. It's about what I've put inside of you. It's about who I created you to be and who I can mold you to be if you just cooperate with me and follow me. Wow, okay, well, that sounds terrifying, but let's go. And so I've, I've been on this journey now following the Lord, and I'm just amazed sometimes when I turn around and go, God, I don't know how or why you've chosen to let me have the life that I have. But I resonate with this part of Peter's story where when Jesus meets Peter, he sees him in all of his flaws and failure, and he speaks to the potential in Peter's life. I hope that's an encouragement to someone here this morning that feels like a failure. You feel like you've let God down. You feel like you don't have much to offer the kingdom. Welcome to the party. Like that's, we're a church full of those people. We serve a savior who calls out the best in us that he has put in us. It's not about what we've done. It's about his story and what he's doing in us and through us. I love that stuff. We should just stop right there and pray and go home. But I got a few more verses to cover. Verse 43. All right, we're going to meet a few more characters here. Jesus is building his team. By the way, I should tie that into the whole Jersey thing. See, Jesus didn't tell Peter, I need you to be the best of the best for you to wear my jersey. Jesus is saying, you just need to follow me and you can wear my jersey because it's not about your ability to play for my team. It's about my ability at work inside of you. So put on my jersey. Like, Jesus has a much different standard than the NFL. And I'm grateful for that because the Vikings still have not called me to play for them. So whatever. Verse 43 says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. All right, here's a few more characters. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Jesus would extend that same invitation to anyone in the sound of my voice this morning. Philip like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael. Look at this chain thing happening again. Philip goes and he finds this dude named Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Look at the next verse here, Nathanael's response to Philip. Philip's all excited. We've met this Jesus. We know who he is. Come. Come. And instead of just an immediate, I'm with you, Nathaniel responds by saying this, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, and then look at Philip's response, come and see. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Jesus finds Philip. Philip finds Nathaniel. Nathaniel has some doubts. He's got some questions before he's just ready to jump in and follow Jesus. Have you ever felt like you've got doubts about following Jesus? Can I just tell you it's okay to have doubts about following Jesus? Some people just readily accept Christ in faith and take that step very easily, and some have some questions. Whoa, 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 we got to talk about a few things before I'm going to drink that Kool-Aid. That's Nathaniel. Nathaniel's going, what, what, whoa, whoa, Jesus of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, backstory. A few weeks ago, remember when we were in like verse 12 of John chapter 1 that was basically saying the light has come into the world, but the world did not recognize it? And remember I was telling you probably one of the reasons that the world did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the light of the world, is because Jesus had a fairly unimpressive resume up to this point. Other than the fact that there was some pretty cool, crazy claims around his birth and some amazing things that happened around his birth, he kind of went underground for the next 30 years. He was the son of a carpenter. He was ultimately from this place called Nazareth. And so don't say the name of the community, but you all know wherever you're watching, there's a community somewhere not too far from you where everyone's kind of like, ew, you know, nothing good comes from there. Right? So don't say the names of the communities. We all have a thought in mind. Someone might say your community, so stop it. All right? But that's what Nathaniel said. He's like, Nazareth? You're talking about the Son of God coming out of Nazareth? So he's got this, this roadblock. There's something in his mind where he's going, no, 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 that can't be. The Son of God, the, the promised Messiah, can't come from a place like Nazareth. Here's what I want you to see. Here's, here's the, for the Christians in the sound of my voice. Notice how Philip handled Nathaniel's objections to his invitation. Notice what he did. Did you catch the part where he got on Facebook and totally blasted Nathaniel and called him out in front of the whole world? Did you catch that part in there? 
I didn't either. Instead, what he did was he just gave a simple invitation. Just come and see. Just come and meet this Jesus for yourself. And I want to say a word right here. I just want to pause. This is kind of a thought that hit me as I was preparing this message this week. I want to speak to the Christians this morning in the sound of my voice. If you are not a Christ follower, feel free to not listen to what I'm getting ready to say for the next few minutes because I'm going to yell at Christians, okay? Like, just check your fantasy football settings, make sure everything's ready to go for today. Christians, play, pay careful attention to how Philip responded to a doubting Nathaniel. Here's, here's what I want to say to Christians. I see this all the time. And I, I'm going to be honest, I've been guilty of it before too, and God's convicted me of this, and I'm trying not to be that guy. I know Christians that when you meet them face to face, when I meet you face to face, you seem very kind and loving and patient, and you seem very much Christ like when we're together. You're patient. You're, you're, you're kind to me. You seem like you're kind to others. You seem like the love of Christ is in you. And I can watch those Christians on social media. You would never know that's who they really are because on social media, something about the, the anonymity of the internet or the ability to, to take shots at people from my underwear in my kitchen, right? Like we feel this courage to be nasty toward people that we otherwise would not be nasty toward. And sometimes I see Christians lashing out in anger, in condemnation, in judgmental posts about stuff going on in the world. And it's not good stuff. Like, let's just be honest. We live in a messed up world where there's sin, there's wickedness, there's evil in the world. And I'm not saying Christians should not have a presence in the world or should not respond. But here's what I'm saying. If you want someone to be convinced of the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the way to get them there is to simply show them Jesus. Not to beat them over the head with your arguments and your logic and your reason and your anger. I'm 38. I'm, this month I turn 39. I always forget how old I am, and it just gets worse with every passing year. I turn 39 this month, okay? Okay. I'm just going to tell you something, church. In 30, almost 39 years, I have never once heard this testimony. I have never once heard somebody say, man, you want to know what caused me to become a Christ follower? It's when I saw the nasty, condescending tone of that Christian on Twitter. That right there was the thing where I was like, I got to meet their Savior. Man, the, the way that they just lashed out and shut everyone down with that meme on Facebook. Oh my goodness, I need to know who put that joy into their life. Never heard anyone share that testimony of how they came to know Christ. But I've heard many testimonies where even the hardest of hearts came to recognize who Jesus was by how another Christ follower showed them Jesus and how we lived and how we loved him. And so Philip, I just want to draw that out of this story. Philip, he just responded to Nathaniel's objections with a simple invitation. Just come and see him. Once you get to know him, that whole Nazareth thing, you'll be like, whatever. I, don't, I guess, yeah, maybe good things do come from Nazareth. By the way, this isn't in my notes, but I should preach a message about God can do great things in small places. I do a podcast every week to pastors where that is the theme, that we serve a God who can do amazing things out of places like Bethlehem and Nazareth. Hey, Flandreau, God is not turned off by the fact that we're a small town of 2,300 people in rural South Dakota and most of the country doesn't even know we're a state. God is not unimpressed by that. That's what I tell pastors all the time. God is not turned off by the number on the population sign on the edge of your city. We serve a God who loves to do big things in small places. So yeah, Jesus from Nazareth, it's cool that no one else knew about Nazareth or what they did know they didn't like about it. We serve a God that does amazing things in small places. That wasn't even in my notes. That one was for free right there. Okay, verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, now watch this. Nathanael, who had all these doubts a second ago, he's about to get his sandals rocked off. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Once again, Jesus is speaking to the potential of Nathanael. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Mind blown. Like, this dude saw me before he ever knew me. And right there, we're going to see in just a moment, Nathaniel was convinced Jesus is who he says he is. But before we get on to that last portion of Scripture, let me just draw that theme out again. Jesus spoke to the potential in Nathaniel's heart. 
And the same is true of you and me, guys. Long before you ever heard the name of Jesus, long before you ever sat in a church, long before you ever were convinced that there might be something about this, the claims around this person of Jesus, Jesus knew you and he saw your heart and he wanted you and he loved you and he had already come on the greatest rescue mission of all time for you. Before you ever saw him, he took the first step. He saw you and he knew you. And if I'm speaking to anyone out there today where you're like, man, I don't know if anybody wants me. I don't know if anybody even cares about me. I want you to know there is a God in heaven who knows every detail of your heart and your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he loves you and he wants you in a relationship. And he will speak to the best what he has put inside of you. He will call out that potential of a new identity in him. So this blows Nathanael away. Verse 49, we'll, we'll get to the end of the passage here. Then Nathanael declared, look what he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Pay attention to that. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. You're, you want to follow me? I'll show you some really cool stuff. That, we're just getting started. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Chapter 1 comes to a conclusion right there. Real quick story, what is he saying there? I'm not going to go into it, but if you want to jot down Genesis chapter 28, like verses 10 through 17, Jesus is reaching back to the Old Testament and he's referring to this really interesting story when Jacob, who also was given a new name, who knows what Jacob's new name was? Anybody? Anybody? Israel. Did you know the 12 tribes of Israel came from the 12 sons of one guy named Jacob who God gave a new name, Israel, because Jacob meant deceiver. And that's a whole other message for a whole other time. Anyway, Jacob had this amazing moment where he had this dream. And in his dream, he saw this ladder going to heaven and he saw angels ascending and descending on this ladder. So Jesus is reaching back to that story. And really the subtle statement that Jesus is making is, I am that ladder. I'm the way to heaven. And you're going to see that again and again, Nathaniel, as you follow me. And hey, church, I'm going to tell you, as we go through the book of John, as we continue through this, you're going to see again and again that Jesus is these things. I want you to write down real quick, because here's kind of a summary of our passage today. Jesus is inviting us to join his team. You don't have to be the best of the best. That's good news, because it's open to anyone that would come. Come and see. That's Jesus' invitation. Come and see who I am. Become my disciple. Choose to follow me. Put your faith and trust in me. Accept me into your life as your Lord and Savior. And then, once you're on my team and you have my jersey, here's the playbook. Go and tell. Go and tell and bring others to me. And here's, according to this passage, I want to give you three things that we're supposed to go and tell the world about Jesus. Number one, write this down. Jesus is the Son of God. He says it here, and we're going to see it all throughout the book of John, that Jesus Christ is divine. He is God. He is deity. He is the Lord. He is the promised one. He's the Messiah. He is God. Number two, Jesus is the king of kings. And Nathaniel just referred to him as the king of Israel, but we know he's more than just the king of Israel. He is the king above all other kings past, present, future. And by the way, next to that, you should just jot down this little word. The word is authority. Not only is he God, he's king. He has authority to tell me what to do. And see, we're Americans. We don't like that. We like our freedom. No one's going to tell me what to do. I'm an American. I'm an independent person with freedom. Praise God for our political freedom, but we still serve a king. And he has the right to tell us what to do because he is God and I'm not. He is king and I'm not. And I just want to say one thing. This thought hit me this morning as I was kind of praying through my message and practicing it on the way home from Sioux Falls this morning. I got to tell you real quick. Has anyone noticed like there's some crazy stuff going on in our world today? Have, have you seen anything like massive hurricanes tearing into places, wildfires burning out of control, earthquakes happening in other parts of the world? Has anyone else noticed this? And I don't want to be an alarmist. I'm not going to be an alarmist and and just scream like, oh, the end is near, it's coming. But I am going to tell you this. I don't claim to be an expert in when Jesus is coming back. But what I know is that he told us that as the end times are drawing closer, we're going to see this very thing playing out in our world. 
Israel's going to be the focal point of every nation in the world is going to have their sights for good or bad set on Israel. There's going to be natural disasters. Here's my point, how I'm tying this in with authority. And I just thought about this with this whole hurricane thing. You know, like, we've been, we have the ability now to look out and say, hey, this hurricane's coming. It's getting closer. It's a day out. It's 12 hours out. Like, take cover, evacuate, get out of the way. It amazes me that, you know, unlike a tornado that can just kind of spin out of the sky and drop down on us out of nowhere, a hurricane, we actually have a little time to prepare and plan. And it amazes me that there are people who hear the word of warning and they don't heed the word of warning. They stick around, ah, maybe it'll miss us, it won't be that bad. And then they're calling for help and it's too late. And what I want to say is this about the authority of King Jesus. The day is coming that every single human being on this planet, past, present, and future, your knee will bow before the authority of King Jesus. You don't have to believe that for it to be true. The day is coming that you will stand before the God who created you and you will give an account for your life. And in that moment, there's no amount of moral uprightness in you or me that is going to help us make the cut for Team Jesus. In that moment, the only question that will matter is did we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior while we had time to choose him and receive him? So I say that with a word of warning, with a word of caution, with a word of invitation. Accept Christ while you have time, before time runs out, because Jesus is the King of kings, and you will bow before him, and your tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe that with all my heart. And finally, Jesus is the only path to God. That's referring to that story from Genesis 28. Jesus Christ, we're going to hear him claim in John that there is no other way to be forgiven. There's no other way to have our sins dealt with. There's no other way to receive the gift of eternal life except through faith in Jesus and in him alone, period. I know in a world that's very pluralistic where we want to say the only truth we accept is that there is no truth and that you get to make up what's right for you and I can make up what's right for me and you can say two plus two is four and I can say two plus two is five and we can both be right because there is no absolutes. There is a God in heaven who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is a, a statement, that is a truth claim that demands a response from every single human heart. My challenge to you today would be, if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today is the day that you bow your knee before his authority and receive him into your life. And if you are a Christ follower, man, be that living link I should have titled my message something different. Be that link in the chain that tells others about Jesus and who he is and bring your friends to Christ. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer today. God in heaven, we're so grateful for this time that you've given to us. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather as your people and to worship you. Jesus Christ, you are the one true living God. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and we worship you as the Son of God. We worship you as the king above all kings and as the only path to heaven. I pray right now, Jesus, if there's a single person in the sound of my voice who has never bowed their knee before your authority and claimed you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they spend time with you and come to know you for who you really are, that they would accept your invitation to come and see for themselves who you are, and that today would be the day that they would call upon your name for the gift of eternal life. Lord, for those of us who know you, for those of us who wear your jersey, I pray we would wear it with pride. Not because pride in our own ability, but pride in who our Savior, who our leader is, and what you've done for us. That we would step into that story, that potential that you've put inside of us. Lord, you've called us to do great things. I pray that we would just cooperate with that story and that we would be a part of that eternal team that is going and telling and bringing people to Jesus. Lord, I pray you'd use this message in a powerful way. Use it for your glory, for your honor. We love you, Jesus. God, I pray that today, even though most people in Flandreau don't even care about this, I pray that you would use the Seahawks in a mighty way to smite the Green Bay Packers and that you'd be with the Vikings this season. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. God, you notice I use the Bible word smite. If, you, if God smites someone, it's not a good thing. I'm a Seahawks fan today. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Rescue Church Past Messages. 
To hear our messages live, head to one of our physical campuses or check out our iCampus at therescuechurch.tv every Sunday at 10 a.m.